coming up next on the Wet Fly Swing Podcast. If you're in shallow water, keep your rod angle lower, but lead more, uh, keeping the tension on the flies. If you go more vertical, and typically, a lot of times that, that water type is a little bit faster moving anyway. Again, transitions from a shelf or a shallow riffle, you know, dropping into a pool, that sort of thing. So you can pull your flies just slightly or, or accelerate your rod speed a little bit more through the drift. If it's a little bit deeper, a little slower, then your rod is going to go more vertical. That was Norm Octima with a nice tip for your next nymphing trip. A deep dive into stillwater fishing and a bonus Euro nymphing segment today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the show. Did you know you can follow this show right now and, uh, and actually get updated directly from your podcast when our next episode goes live? If you're on Apple Podcasts, you can do this by clicking that plus button in the upper corner of your app. Uh, Give it a shot. If you haven't followed the show, this will be a good chance to never miss a new episode. Today's episode is sponsored by Bear Vault, who has the perfect solution to keep your provisions secure while heading into the backcountry. Bear Vault builds a rugged polycarbonate locking canister that keeps bears and other wild critters out of your food. You can check out Bear Vault right now, wetflyswing.com slash bear vault. That's B-E-A-R-V-A-U-L-T. And you support this podcast by clicking over to Bear Vault. We're also sponsored today by Lake Lady Rods, building distinctive custom rods, each created one at a time to the exact specifications for you. Lake Lady only uses top of the line world-class components, great fly rods, and a great custom package. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash lake lady l-a-k-e-l-a-d-y to support this podcast and a great local rod builder norm time is here to walk us through the steps of preparing to fish a new still water we discover how to analyze a lake before you get started how the lock style can be more effective and and how to fish buggers and leeches we're going old school on this one this is a great one so uh so get ready for it We've got a Euro nymphing and competitive world champion on the show today. So without further ado, here he is, Norm Machtima. How's it going, Norm? Pretty good, pretty good. It's early. Uh, just real quick, to all of your listeners out there, this man is putting in the work for y'all. Nice. It's 6 o'clock a.m. his time, 7 a.m. my time. Dave's getting his work done for you guys, so yep. shout out, Dave. That's it, man. Thanks for that. I'm here with you in the struggle. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, we got up early. You can probably tell from my voice. It's a little bit, uh, it's got the morning voice going. We've got uh, yeah. another podcast right after this one with uh, with Anne uh, out from UK, uh, from Semperfly. So we're going to be like going across the world and, you know, we're starting here. Well, we're going to dig into where you're at and, uh, and all that. And we're going to talk some about uh, still water fishing, Euro nipping, world championships, Um but uh, but before we jump into all that, take us into fly fishing. How did you first get into fly fishing? Oh man, um, how I got into it actually. My my dad is the one who got me into it when I was a wee tyke. <laughs> um, basically, about seven years old is when I started fly fishing. Had been fishing, you know, just conventional gear, casting bubble and a woolly bugger probably before that. And uh, but we did a trip to Yellowstone uh, when when I was about seven years old and. Uh, he got me my first fly rod, and uh, that just kicked it off from there. So uh, that's that was you know just down and dirty how I got into fly fishing. Yeah. So your whole life, uh, and and now and now where are you now? Well, right now, you know, that's what I'm 42. Just turned 42. So that's how many years of fly fishing, guiding, uh, competing, and uh, with Team USA. And, uh, you know, so just a, a, a lot of fly fishing adventures and experiences down the road here. Uh, but right now, you know, I currently live in New Mexico, uh, Rio Rancho. I grew up in the little town of Pecos, which has the Pecos River. That was 10 minutes from uh, where we lived. And um, so, you know, those kind of backyard fishery type situation. Um, great thing about my childhood you know, these were back in the de- in the times where <laughs> parents were pretty lax and uh, yep. willing just to let you free out in the world. And uh, as a kid, I would, in the summers, my dad would drop me off at the river or the lake, the local pond there, and um, 
along with a box of extra flies that I tie and just uh, let me loose for a day. And he'd come back, pick me up about four or meet with me and go and he'd fish for the rest of the afternoon with me. But, uh, yeah, I was slinging flies at the lake, selling them to people cause they were watching me catch fish on them. <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, that's how and my time of fly fishing started. <laughs> that's it. That's, yeah. that's cool. Right. And, and the TVSA is always interesting. We've had a number of people probably, I'm sure you were on your, uh, on your team when you're out there, uh, you know, Devin Olson and Lance and some other folks. Yeah. So yeah, we're slowly ticking away. It's amazing. You know, I always love talking to you guys because you, you know, it's that upper level, right? I mean, the, the, the competition stuff is just a, a different ball game. Um, oh, yeah. but how'd that come to be? Uh, so I started on the youth team, U.S. youth team. Uh, it was the first year they had a World Youth Championship, uh, which was held in Wales. Uh, that was for uh, 1998. So in 97, um, the youth team, the, the organizers and coaches, they sent out inquiries to fly shops kind of around the country. And uh, at that point, actually, I was, I was already working uh, at High Desert Angler, uh, which is who I guide for right now. So I had started as a summer gig there, and I was 17, you know, just working a shop, filling fly bins and that sort of thing. And uh, so um, my boss, she got word and recommended me. I think I was already back at school when they got the recommendation. Anyway, it just kind of snowballed from there. Uh, my high school advisor, he sent a recommendation. My dad had contacted him and my dad had sent a recommendation or a, like a, I don't know, some sort of note. And, um, eventually it came to me where I had to send in a bio, you know, the usual, why do I think I should be on fly fishing team? You'll say blah, blah, blah. And, uh, was selected out of, I don't know how many applicants, seven of us were chosen and we made it on to fly fishing team. you say. And uh, as a local note, I heard your podcast or your, yeah, your podcast and interview with uh, Taylor Strike. Oh, yeah. Uh, so Nick and I were on the same team that year. Oh, wow. And so Nick was on, on the team. Wow. Yeah, yeah. He was on the team uh, for that year. So, yeah, both of us were on there. And, uh, yeah, we made it out to UK. And funny thing is the adult team had already been competing since the early 80s. With no significant results, a uh, very different time for Team USA back then. And with our help, uh, or with the help of um, Davey Watton, who's uh, oh, yeah. a pretty well-known uh, wet flag guy, you know, who, oh, amazing yeah. angler. But he's from Wales, so he came on as our assistant coach and helped us immensely. And then oh, that wow. was the that was the intro to, well, back then, it was a little more dialed in as far as like Czech nymphing, Polish nymphing. There was these different separations and in nymphing styles, um, subtle, but you know, they, <laughs> they were definitely yep. proud of their specific techniques. Uh, so that's how I got into uh, that. But, uh, yeah, we went to Wales, no high expectations from us or anybody else for that matter. Cause, uh, the adult team never did well. No. Nope. And it ended up, uh, our team finished in second. Uh, wow. so we got a silver and I won the individual gold that year. Holy so. cow. Was that the, uh, what, what year was that? That was 98. Oh, wow, 98. Yeah, so I was the World Youth Champion in 1998. The first medalist, I guess, for no Team kidding. USA. <laughs> World, that's, that's amazing. So, I mean, what, what does that feel like? I, I think I asked, I can't remember one of the other um, folks we've had on, you know, that same question. But what did that feel like for you on, on getting that gold? I don't know, man. It was, it was surreal, for sure. Uh, you know, I wasn't expecting it and just going in. Having a good time, a, a kid from New Mexico, you know, rural New Mexico, desert state in Wales competing in a fly fishing tournament. I was just amazed to be in Wales. It was everything I imagined kind of the UK being, you know, um, yep. added on with some pretty good fishing. Um, but no, it, it was amazing. Um, you know, I always reflect back and just kind of, you know, wonder how things would have been if if I hadn't had that opportunity. But no, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. And once you win that, what's the next step? Is that kind of catapult you in further into Team USA? Uh, it did. Uh, so the coach, or basically the owner of Team USA at that time, his name was Walter Ungerman. Uh, he obviously got word of me and, and our coaches kind of sent word up the line to the adult team. 
and I was the assistant coach in 99 for the youth team. So we traveled to uh, Ireland and um, I fished with Walter and he basically just extended out, uh, you know, if I was interested in competing with the adult team. And so kind of just left it at that. And I was like, yeah, sure. And in 2001, uh, I was invited uh, to be on the adult team. And then uh, we traveled to 2001 was Slovakia. So that's where uh, we competed there. Very different uh, level of game there. Um, you know, much bigger field. It's very different when you go from the youth when you go from the youth to the adult uh, yeah. world championships. It's it's a much bigger platform. But um, yeah, and that's how it started. And then 2006 on, uh, Team USA really started tighten up their their competition series, qualifiers, and going through that process in order to garner a, a competitive team. And that's where you see uh, Devin and Lance come in, mm-hmm. and George Daniels, you know, mm-hmm. all, all that crew. Uh, so, wow. so yeah. you were there. You were there at the really the beginning that transfer over from and I I'm trying to think who told the story but we had that one where it was just a a rough shot group of guys back in the day and then yeah um, it was it was a Jeff good Courier, old boy. right Jeff Curry maybe yeah, was Courier, there and then yeah so Courier was on the team with me too back then oh okay but yeah so he was part of he was before me so when I came on uh, Jeff was already on the team and so I had met him and fished and competed with him he's awesome dude and loved Curry yeah. um. Yeah. And then we progressed from there, and then it it uh, changed into uh, getting more competitive. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, Courier was on the on the team. <laughs> that was cool, nice. So yeah, it's it's. I love the. Maybe we'll save a little bit of the the Team USA for the end if we have time here. I, I want to dig in some on uh, because I did have something I know in 2018. There's uh, and this might play into some of the Stillwater stuff here, but um, I want to talk a little about Stillwater fishing because that's something that we you know don't always get a chance to talk a ton about and right. the cool thing here is you did it right with team USA. So it's more, yeah. Kind of, I don't know what you call that, right. More of a, uh, well, I guess a competition style lake fishing. Um, but could, maybe that, can we do that today? Like dig into a little of like still water and, and what that oh, looks sure. like. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking, what were the lakes? Cause I know this came from Zach. He actually gave me a shout out to you. He was, uh, um, oh, right on. Yeah. Up, yeah. Is that, <laughs> you, know, you know, Zach. Yeah. Totally. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Awesome. And, uh, and Zach, uh, he actually uh, co-hosted actually, the episode quick, a while quick back. Yeah. Question. Uh, hey Zach, uh, where are the videos at, man? I'm missing the uh, flying ties videos. <laughs> nice. I'm missing them. I love his videos. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Perfect. So, so yeah, but he kind of gave a shout out and, um, and I just, and it was a good point because I love still water fishing and I'd love to hear more. I know there's, it's a little bit different, but, um, maybe we can talk about that. How you, that, I think that was one of Zach's question was how, like, how do you fish or how do you approach a new lake? Right. You're coming in this thing, you're looking around the lake looks like, like there's no, you know, how do you know where to start? What, what's your strategy there? Right. Uh, yeah. Lakes still water for Americans is very daunting and uh you know exactly it's it's a blank piece of paper and you're like mm-hmm. all right now what do i do yeah it can be very simple or as simple as just reading the contour of the land that you're standing on for the most part so you know if you're fishing from the bank uh which you know most people they may not have a boat or anything like that to access to get out away from the shore but uh when you're looking at uh banks and that sort of thing look for any ridges uh, you know, uh, drop offs, boulder fields, you know, and, and again, it's, it's, uh, when you're looking at still water, it's definitely more structure based. Um, you know, it's just like, just like you would do on a, in a river too, you know, you're, you're reading the structure, uh, of the, and the contour of the river bottom to kind of help you determine where the more likely spot for a trout to hold would be. However, when you're dealing with still water, instead of trout really holding and focusing on one specific spot, they do cruise, you know, they, they cycle through a territory. So, um, that can be a little disheartening when you're fishing and, you know, all of a sudden you, you're just kind of like, man, I don't know if there's oh, anything right. here. And then, you know, you just kind of got to sit and wait and cause they'll come back through and then you finally get one. But when that happens, make the most of it, get your cast back, get that fish landed, get your cast back there, out there. Cause uh, you may, you may find a, a few more within that little pod. Uh, so a lot of it is searching out pods of fish sometimes, mm-hmm. but that's a pretty 
simple way to kind yeah. of break down initially what you need to look for. Yeah, that's the first thing. Um, so you're saying you look on the land, and if there's a a steep slope coming into it, you know you probably know it's going to be a pretty deep area. Versus say there's a boulder patch on the bank, and that there's probably some boulders down in the water, that sort of stuff. Right, right, and it depends on your species of trout too. Uh, rainbows, you know, they're going to behave a little more differently than browns. You know, browns I I find do like the bigger ambush points you know they, they can be more of an ambush type predator in, in still water situations your rainbows you know they can be a little bit more uh kind of losing the word pelagic for lack of a better word oh, you right. know they're, yeah, they're like out cruising. Just cruising exactly so yeah. they can be a little bit more scattered uh so but yeah look for those high points those ridge lines that enter water that can create a nice underwater point uh, and then, yeah, if your water visibility is decent enough where you can see any drop offs or shelves, uh, work those transition points, uh, just like you would work a shelf in a river. Um, yeah. you right. know, again, it just creates the, those opportunities for, uh, either bait fish or aquatic insects to congregate. Uh, but at the same time gives the fish, uh, access to escape and evade predators. Right. So, Right, right. That's key. That and how did it, we're in? Was it twenty eighteen when the nationals were uh, in Eastern Oregon? Yeah, that's correct. Twenty eighteen. Yeah, and what was that? What, what did you guys do there? Was that um, was that something where you were kind of? Well, that's probably your home. You probably knew some of those lakes or not? Uh, no, actually. Well, we had been to Bend a few times for regionals and another national uh, championship, uh, but this that year. Uh, I believe they were the team was intending to go to Wales uh, for World Championships, which was going to be all lakes. So a lot of times, what Team USA does is they garn or gear their their regionals or their nationals in particular of that year of the World Championships oh, right. uh, to match or mirror the water type they would be fishing. So mm -hmm. uh, Wales was intended to be primarily all uh, still water. And so we did our national championships to be all primarily all still water, although they had the upper Deschutes in, in, uh, in, in the mix there too. But, uh, yeah, I think we were on Lava Lake and, mm -hmm. uh, Crane Prairie. Oh, nice. Nice. Twin, one of the twin lakes. Yeah. So, um, we had never fished Crane Prairie before, which was awesome. I, I yeah. do like that lake a lot. Pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah. it's so, awesome. Um, but yeah, so that's how how they came up with obviously the venues for that world, uh, national championship. That's how they did it. Well, so what yeah. was it like when you came into Crane, or maybe take us into the that national and the, the lake? So how are you approaching Crane Prairie? You haven't fished it before. It is a really amazing lake. It's got big fish and uh, and a lot of food. Yeah. So uh, you know, and this actually goes. Obviously, you wanted to wait to get into Team USA stuff, but this is yeah, kind of do, yeah, keep all going yeah. together. So yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, with these with these competitions, you're especially with nationals, you're rolling in as a team. So you have a team of five, and so we spend and dedicate time before the competition to go and look at venues. Uh, you know, competition venues are off limits for about sixty days prior to the competition. And so <clears throat> we can go look at it, and if they have any of the venues set up, uh, you know, that's what we're looking at the specific competition section and mapping out what we got going on there. Uh, as far as the reservoirs and lakes, uh, they give us typically, I think, scheduled time slots for teams to go out and look at the lakes. So, you know, you can sign up for this uh, time frame and, and other and get a boat, possibly if you need to get a boat or if it's a, a what they call a lock style session. So you're out in a boat. Uh, you can get a boat and go up and, and look around. You know, you're mapping, just like what I was mentioning, mapping those drop-offs, those points, mm -hmm. those wind breaks and all this, you know. So that's how you're just getting the initial overview of, of what you're looking at. Uh, and then, you know, if it's a bank session, you're looking at what your bank contours could be because, you know, you're standing on the bank and you you rotate on those beats. So, you know, you're not just sitting in the one little section kind of. Yeah. Were you in the boat or were you doing on the bank on this one? Uh, you do it all basically. Oh, so, you do it all. Uh, South Twin, I think we were. It was a bank session. Uh, lava crane and the other reservoirs that we were on were boat sessions, lock style sessions. So you got to be versed in in kind of all of it, really. Um, how to work from the bank and how to work out of a boat. And then 
Google Maps. You know, Google Maps is huge. You know, doing a lot of that aerial aerial mm-hmm. reconnaissance. <laughs> mm-hmm. So that's how we spend a lot of time uh, doing a lot of research before we go into these competitions. Uh, not necessarily looking at the lake itself physically, but you know, again through online yeah. resources as well, and, and local knowledge. You know, a lot of times we'll hit up uh, either guys that we know out, that live out there, uh, fly shops, other guides. Mm. You know, so yeah, that's right. So that's it. So just like a, I mean, somebody listening now could be thinking like, you know, you're heading out to a new lake, and that's always a good thing, right? Call a local fly shop, talk to a guide, get exactly. Some info. So you get that, get the uh, the Google Maps going. So once you get, um, so now you probably have some flies. You probably know what you might be using, some hatches. Once you get to the lake, you know, maybe you can take us to how that worked with the, the competition or just talk in general. Let's, let's take Crane Prairie, right? You get there, you haven't fished it before. What's your first step? So going back to what you had already gathered as far as intel, uh, you know, looking at maps and, and just a, a brief overview of the lake. Um you know, you hit your your most uh, likely spots. So, you know, again, those those ridges that extend out, you kind of work through there. But granted, and, and uh, keep in mind, when you're fishing in these competitions, especially in lake sessions, especially on a boat, you have another competitor that's on the boat, not your teammate necessarily, but or at all, but another competitor. So you're competing against the guy in the boat. However, it does help and benefit both of you to work together in mm. a sense to figure this out because obviously if one does well, the other guy should do well also. Um, but one, one competitor will have captainship of the boat. And so for the first half of the, of the session, so they'll say, I want to go in this area and, you know, work through there. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, you just end up sharing, well, you know, we kind of looked at this spot over here and this could be something worthwhile to check out too. And you, you really kind of eliminate, you don't spend a, a lot of time in one spot if you're just like, man, all right, this is uh, with temperature, you know, sunlight applications and stuff like that. Uh, time of year, again, you know, you're looking at your hatches and that sort of thing. Um, you know, if it's earlier in the spring, a lot of times these fish are just opportunistic and wanting to feed on, you know, bugger type patterns. Uh, in UK, they call them lures. And, mm-hmm. Or as you get further into summer, early fall, you're dealing with damsels, you know, it could be in coronavirus sessions, uh, calabatus, a lot of other varying uh, food availabilities there. So, yeah. Um, so I think when we were there, um, you know, buggers was kind of the name of the game. Um, as long as you know, you're being opportunist or getting that opportunistic behavior out of the fish. Uh, that was that worked well for us. That was it. That's so awesome that you guys on a a, ch- a competition, you, had, you buggers were that were the name of the game. Yeah, they're a little more fancy though. So <laughs> yeah, what, what what were they? How are they different from your normal woolly bugger with the three? So uh, uh, you know, a lot of them are tied with varying material. They're not like your traditional woolly bugger with the olive or black chenille. Pop. You know, they they look yeah. very similar. They could be uh, a lot of them tied like pops bugger style. If you're familiar familiar with that fly, uh, it's tied with palmer chenille, still marabou tail, but maybe two toned. Uh, and you know, you're dealing with a lot of UK type bugger patterns, uh, humongous, uh, type flies, uh, humongous is the name of the pattern. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, a humongous for those, he, those of you who don't know, it's a, uh, just a standard woolly bugger, but tied with, um, either some silver or gold, um, crystal flash, uh, yeah. chenille or crystal chenille. And, um, the tail typically is about three times the length of the body. Normally, the body is never bigger than a size 10 or 8 short shank. So, yep. you know, short shank hook. Uh, but just tons of movement in the tail when you extend it out. And people always are, you know, suspicious whether or not fish hook up well because of the length of the tail. The tail being marabou, it's super soft. And a lot of times, these fish are going for the head of the fly anyway. So, they're already on the hook and you don't miss too many. But nice thing with marabou, if you are getting those little short strikes, which happens normally mostly with stalkers because they're just nipping, tasting, and, and trying to figure out the world, uh, you can with marabou you can just pinch the tail off and shorten it down, and and you know that maximizes your hookup ratio. So, oh, there you go. And and so you're saying that the tail typically you're tying these things that are like twice or three times as long as the body. About three times, yeah. Yeah, yeah three times. Yeah, so that's huge. So that definitely is longer than. 
you know, I think sometimes, yeah, two times, but three is great. So that's a long, yeah. and then I'm looking at the, I'll put some links in the show notes here for the, the pops bug and that, uh, the a humongous fly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, and you know, some other things, uh, that people are, are learning more about, uh, blobs and, uh, boobies, but blobs is definitely a big one for us. Uh, Daphne in, you know, and it's supposedly supposed to represent Daphne in the water but as as uh, your blobs you know they're just a really bright uh attractor type mm -hmm. egg looking pattern you know so <laughs> uh, yeah. you tie a little foam in the butt and it creates a different uh movement in the fly um but especially when the daff or uh blob gets down lower you have loss of uv light or certain uh, color spectrums get lost. And so you're, you know, if it's a bright orange blob, it actually turns a green color. So uh, that's where that's where it more or less matches Daphne a little bit more. You know, oh, okay. Daphne, they're really tiny. They're, you know, uh, tiny, tiny aquatic, uh, what are they, Chris, uh, bug. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> I haven't well, gotten down into Daphne as much as on any other aquatic insect, but... Uh, they do uh, swim together in like little clumps and clusters, and so trout just kind of roll through and just gulp them up like a like a whale to uh, krill, you know. So yeah, uh, they just kind of vacuum them down. But uh, that's one thing that blobs do. But no, that game, uh, that that late competition was definitely a lot of um, uh, lures or what I yeah you know, big what stuff we call wood uh, So that's what we were running. Rain Ferry was uh, awesome, you know, so we ended up finding a lot of fish and more of the shallow stuff where all that down timber that's in mm -hmm. there is. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that was pretty cool. So, uh, you know, maximizing there's brookies and rainbows and, you know, it was, it was fun. So uh, Lava was a little bit different, a little more damselfly-ish, if you will, because uh, a lot of the weed beds are starting to go. And so you're looking for stuff like that. As the day progresses, fish will hold different levels in the water column. So in the morning, they were higher. Uh, at least uh, a foot to three feet down is was their main feeding area. And as the session progressed, uh, about the last hour, they had dropped. Uh, and that could have just been us pressuring the fish, too. Uh, they dropped down another couple feet. And my boat partner at that time... He was underneath the fish for majority of that session. He didn't change them. He had a heavier line than I was fishing. So I was running a, like an intermediate, uh, slow intermediate uh, line. And so I was in the zone majority of that time. And as that last how, half hour, I didn't change my line weight in really in enough time. And he was able to catch up and tie with me mm -hmm. and uh, beat me that session by like a centimeter or two, something like that. Oh, wow. I was yeah, I was pretty hurt. <laughs> huh. Man. So, He's a good so, buddy. He actually lives down here uh, uh, a few miles from me. His name's Ron Kless. But uh, oh, we, I was, we always give each other crap about that when we're when we're fishing together. But he's, he was in a video that I did not too long ago. But Okay. Uh, he's a good dude. <laughs> nice, nice. And uh, do you, is he's, uh, you have like a YouTube channel there? I do. Uh, and my time of fly fishing also. Okay. So, uh, I, so a lot of these, uh, techniques and stuff with Euro nymphing, still water stuff, although I need to do more still water stuff, uh, do touch on a lot of my videos. Um, they're not just necessarily me going out and just, you know, fishing. I've tried to explain what I'm doing and it's, uh, you know, on the water situation. So I come across what I see, what I'm doing. I'll, I'll approach, you know, uh, approach it as if you were with me and, and uh, you know, work through it. This episode is sponsored by Rare Gear, not only making telescoping fly rods, but rethinking the whole fly fishing kit as we know it. This rod is a blend of traditional and Tenkara styles to make a super highly packable uh, rod that fits literally in your pocket. This thing, uh, I have this thing going everywhere with me. It's in my backpack. It's always there throwing it down you sometimes forget about it but when you need it you can break it out and fold that thing out in a matter of seconds and you're good to go rear also has a folding net some compact wading booties to go along with their telescoping fly rod they've also got a 10 car rod so the number of things going on at rare gear they're a unique as it comes so if you want to see something if you want to see a rod that has no guides 
that uh, pops out and telescopes out in a matter of seconds uh, and is a quality, quality rod. Check out Rare Gear right now. You can do that by heading over to raregear.com and find out what this rod is all about. Coming from the founder, uh, Derek mentioned this is definitely a weird one-of-a-kind rod, so uh, check it out right now, Rare Gear, R-E-Y-R-G-E-A-R.com. You support this podcast by clicking over through that link. So when you're fishing that fly like that woolly bugger style, you know, and it sounds like just an intermediate sink tip, how are you fishing it? Like on crane, how did you, how did you fish that? And, and this was out of a boat? Yeah, so we were out of a boat. Um, and actually, so my whole setup, uh, if you want me to break that yeah, down. Yeah, go for it. Uh, a lot of these lake st- sessions, we're fishing either six, seven weights, some guys even eight weights, uh, 10 foot rods. Um, so a lot of, lot of length. One main reason, well, there's a couple reasons, but one main reason is in competition we're not allowed to stand in the boat, so we got to we got to cast sitting oh, wow. in a sitting position. Uh, so you know, having that extra length helps carry the line up high over the boat that we were not smacking each other. Although it does happen mm-hmm. every once in a while, uh, getting hit behind the head with <laughs> a 200 mile an hour traveling <laughs> bug fly through the air. So yeah, that, that can happen, but that, that's intended to help, um, keep the cast above you. Um, and then at the same time, as we're pulling in or retrieving our flies, uh, once we get to a certain point close to the boat or towards the end of the retrieve, uh, you start to lift your rod and hang the flies away from the boat. So having that extended rod, uh, helps you do that without, you know, being any closer to the boat than you need to, uh, which is a very, very deadly, uh, maneuver at the end. Uh, of your retrieve so you just kind of suspend your fly there for a few seconds if not even longer and kind of you know uh animate them a little bit jig them, yep. that sort of thing so oh and then how far below surface are you doing that uh you normally you can, you can see your flies at that point yeah. so depending on the clarity of the water they could be you're drying them up depending on wow. what sink uh, sink rate line you have uh you're drying them up from whatever depth they are and then just hanging them and you you can see the fish uh, coming around and and you know, you just start messing with them like a, a cat with a little toy. You know, you yeah. just kind of start you know, animating and you see them start around it, pause, wow. yank it up, you know, let it drop back down. You're just doing everything you can to get this fish, this fish to eat. Yeah. And um, it's pretty exciting. And a lot yeah. of times you're able to get them to eat right at the end there. There you uh, go. So. Are you doing the figure eight? It's kind of like the. Uh, no, right? no. <laughs> Trout aren't, aren't as, uh, they're a little more spooky than uh, pike or muskies when you're trying yeah. to do the figure eight. Yeah, there you go. But um, yeah, so you're working a sinking line, and um, like I said, I was fishing. And normally, we we do utilize more full sink lines and sink tips, uh, especially when you're casting at distance. It helps you stay in the zone. Because one thing, when you're in a boat, you're not anchored. Uh, so in lock style fishing, break that down too. Mm-hmm. In lock style yeah. fishing, your boat, you have competitors on both ends of the boat, and if you have a controller who measures and makes sure the competitors are competitors are uh, following the rules he sits in the center just like where a guide would be on a dory uh if you're you know on a drift trip so yeah but your boat stays perpendicular to the wind so uh you're drifting downwind with both anglers facing downwind uh casting downwind so that's there's no trolling you're not allowed to fish behind the boat letting your flies drag with the current uh and a lot of times uh tied to the boat is a drogue or a, a, a water sock, wind sock, if you will. Uh, so it helps slow the boat down a little bit more. So you're actually able to uh, manipulate and get the retrieve um, speed you want. But because you're moving downstream and you're retrieving downwind, your uh, boat is drifting downwind, you're retrieving back towards the boat. Uh, depending on the speed you're drifting, uh, that can affect your sink rate. So if you have a uh, faster moving boat with a lighter line, you're staying really high in the water column because you're having just to really strip fast to maintain contact. Oh, right. If you're trying to animate your flies or create any movement in your flies, you're really having to double up on your speed in order to get that fly to move. But that reduces your your time in the water, basically, because, uh, you know, your, your boat and your fly are coming together quickly. Uh, so one thing that I hope you, if you need to get down deeper, is going to a heavier rated sinking line. So from a, an intermediate type line down to like a, a type six or, or a night six, which is 
theoretically six inches per second its sink rate, which is a pretty fast sinking line. That's that's really fast. It may keep you in that upper three to five feet because of the speed you're having to retrieve uh, and the rate your boat is drifting towards your flies. So <clears throat> you may not be getting the same depth as if it was blowing slower or no wind, you know, at the same cast uh your fly starts to sink because you don't have to speed up to keep contact with your fly uh that die six will get down a lot further uh and same with your intermediate you know your intermediate you're trying to focus on that upper uh three feet of the water column in a lot of situations so it depends on the distance you cast and your speed of retreat you know where your fly stay in the water column and that's all defined where those fish are actually feeding uh, which can be different from where they're holding to where they're feeding. So they right. may hold down and come up to eat. Or, you know, if they're just in that total feed mode, you know, you got bugs and insects moving around, uh, you can stay in that zone a lot longer and um, produce more fish. That's it. So, and the, uh, the so, you know, take it back, you're fishing the intermediate line. Are you, how are you finding the, the level that they're at? What's the easiest way? So if you got a 12 foot deep, uh, body of water how do you know where you're at um it's a lot of time with the line itself uh this uh, countdown uh, oh, yeah. method is good so if we're trying to map out and find where these fish are i usually start with five seconds as soon as i lay the cast down and then i'll start re my retrieve so i'll do at least two or three of those i may i and i after about the second or, th or third uh, cast I'll switch my retrieve up just to see if, if the retrieve has something to do with it. Uh, do about a couple more of those. And then if that doesn't really produce, I'll count down further to 10. Um, and then from there, it'll be 10, a 10 count increment, if you will. So five to 10, 10 to 20. If I finally find a fish, if it's deeper than any of those, 30 or such and uh, my retrieve has some speed to it you know or or a lot more pool or animation then i'll switch to a heavier sink line so it gets down quicker and sooner that way i'm in the zone a lot longer yeah. uh and, and hopefully trying to uh, produce more fish so that that would be when i would make the line change so yeah keep in mind if you get into this uh, lock style still water situation you're going to buy a lot of spools extra spools for your reels so uh, don't spend a lot of money on the reel because you got to get a bunch of spools for it hmm. uh, to have all the different sink rate lines in order to find. Because you're not really, it's not like a suspension rig where you're changing the depth and just lobbing it out and letting a floating line because obviously you don't want to run a sinking line with that. So you, that you just need the one type line to do it. Uh, this is a lot different when you're having to pull and retrieve your flies, uh, keeping them in the zone with those different sink rate lines. Yeah, that's a great, great point. So the retrieve, so when you cast it out there, once you're kind of getting your depth to find the fish, and then what are your different retrieves you might be doing here? So standard, um, you know, uh, 8 to 12-inch pools, uh, the speed or the, the intervals of your pools can vary. Uh, figure rate retrieve, so just kind of creating a nice steady pulsing uh, retrieve depending on the speed you do the figure eight. Uh, or just long, slow, uh, just, you know, all you're doing is maintaining contact with your flies. So a lot like with how they would fish coronamids, but I even do that with a lot of lures or bugger type patterns, you know, uh, nymphs, especially uh, if you're dealing with any calabatus or anything like that. So just drawing a really long, slow pull, just the, the, the length of your, your arm pull and your arm span basically behind you. And then coming back up and then just continuing again. So, and then you have other other retrieves like roly poly where you're, you those fish do want some speed. A lot of times that's with a lot heavier sinking line. Um, so you're getting down deeper, you know. Um, so especially if you're dealing, with, uh, uh, if there's a lot of bait fish in the water, uh, trout do take advantage of that a lot of times. And so, oh yeah, a roly poly retrieve can get them to trigger. There you go. What what uh, what lines are you using here? So you mentioned a few sink lines. So how many sinking lines do you have in your? How many extra spools do you have? Oh man, uh, right now I probably have about twelve spools, extra spools. So uh, it, you know, and uh, there anything from uh, there's so Airflow is one of my favorite uh, sink sinking lines. Uh, being a UK company and the the euros definitely do very well in the late competitions 
you know, they, they definitely pushed the, uh, or created that world. So their lines are really great. Uh, they have two different uh, sinking rate intermediate lines. Uh, so you can really stay right in the surface film or go down just a little bit further uh, in, in, you know, that top water column. They have an intermediate sink tip. Uh, but, you know, then you go from there, type 3, type 4, type 5, type 6, type 7. Uh, and then, obviously, floating line. Uh, Rio has a great midge tip that I like. Uh, I don't know if I haven't seen if they still make that line anymore. It has, like, three-foot midge tip on it. I do like that line quite a bit. Uh and then you have actually some other uh, sink tip lines. So either uh, another, it's like I said, an intermediate sink tip or other uh, sink rate um, sink tips. So, you know, you just have a variety of different lines. My go-tos, honestly, is that uh, either the intermediate lines, uh, type 3 or type 5. Uh, I really don't branch out or need to go to those other uh, lines a lot of times. Yeah, so... But, you know, situations may call for that specific uh, tool for you to use. And especially in competition, I've definitely made the mistake of not rolling with all my gear. You're yeah. like, ah, oh, I don't think I'll need that. You know, conditions, you know, thinking I know everything. <laughs> <laughs> and I get out there, I'm like, dang it, I should have had that line or I should have brought that box of flies. You know, just roll with everything. Have it all with you. Yeah, just bring it all. Yeah, you're in a boat. Well, if you are in a boat, yeah, it's good. It's pretty easy to throw in a bag. Right, exactly. Yeah. So okay, and and so we're floating. I'm just you know in the boat again. I'm trying to think the difference between the. So describe that again when you're floating down with the uh, the lock style. Um, so you've got the boat perpendicular to the wind, and right. and so is there somebody? So there's somebody's rowing it, keeping it perpendicular to the wind. Well, is that kind of how it's, we're working here? Uh, typically, there is, you know. So, uh, but if it's uh, what we call competitor controlled, so you have two anglers on a boat. Uh, but no controller, usually you set the drogue or the, the, uh, that, uh, water sock out and that, you can, you can tether in a way, uh, either closer to the bow or closer to the stern. Uh, so it'll drift true. Uh, and then you don't really have to do much in order to, to it's manage. The drift. Yeah, exactly. So that, uh, that, uh, drift sock does a lot to help, uh, manage the drift on its own. Uh, however, it can be a lot more of a challenge if you have some squirrely winds. You know, you get a lot of these lakes are in bowls or depressions. And so you have winds coming in and they switch direction on you. And that can be, a, you know, a bit of a cluster when you're having to deal with that. But, you know, you yep. got to deal with it. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, yeah, your your boat is set up. So you're perpendicular. You're casting down wind. Competitors, they'll have to the middle of the boat, to the bow or stern off 90 degrees off the bow or stern so that's your quadrant that you're allowed to fish so um legally anyway so yeah you're trying to stay in that realm 90 degrees okay so you got that area in the front and and so what is the advantage of the having the the kind of the wind sock and that out there versus say just i mean what were the other way i guess trolling right is one way to do it what, what's the advantage trolling or anchoring you know uh really what it does it allows you to cover water uh, you, again, you know, you look at the behavior of trout in still water, they're cruising, they don't stay stationary. So if you do have a decent breeze going, uh, a lot of times they create, uh, the wind does create like little, uh, drift lines. So you're, uh, um, you make your cast, you can find these little, uh, wind lines that are created and you can work those wind lines. They're almost like an eddy. Hmm. Uh, so you're just working your way downstream working that that those wind lines so what the fish do is they'll go down uh to the basically start of a wind line or the the downwind portion of the wind line and just cruise up the wind line you'll see like the foam foam is home uh you know like you would see on the uh eddy uh, seam of an eddy and so you can work it that way that way however at the same time what it allows you to do too is if you do find a pot of a fish you work through them, you may catch, you know, one or two. Um, and as you drift past, you can use the boat to maneuver, get back out and around and try to relocate them again. If you kind of feel like they're moving, you know, east to west or whatever, uh, you can reposition the boat and try to work through that pot again and, and pick up a couple mm -hmm. more. So, uh, but also drifting across a point, uh, stuff like that. It just allows you to cover more water, cover fish. And obviously you want to cover new fish. 
um, because they'll be a lot more willing to feed and, and take your flies. So. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we were, I was just thinking we were up at, at a BC uh, last month and uh, we were kind of doing something similar. We didn't have the wind sock, but we had, there was some fish working like kind of towards the bank and we were, I'd have, you know, it was just me and another guy in the boat and he would be rowing and then we the wind would slowly be pushing us down and, uh, you know, we'd get within the bank so we could cast towards the bank. Yeah, it was right. like every, every time you made that cast, you know, towards the bank, you'd give it a few, kind of stripped it, working it in. It was like fish on. And exactly. You're being, you know, somewhat stealthy working, you know, letting the wind push you rather than relying on trolley motor or rowing constantly. You yeah. Know, you can kind of just adjust, tweak with the oars a little bit. Exactly. And get dialed in. Really. That's why it's fun. Yeah. Exactly. That's why it's fun. <laughs> it is fun because the trolling is, you know, you're trolling. It's kind of like you're always rowing, but actually having the wind using that, yeah, it's way more peaceful and kind of easier to do. Yeah, exactly. And, and I mean, yeah, trolling is lame <laughs> yeah you do catch fish doing it though but but yeah you're just kind of sitting there it's just you know yeah trolling is boring yeah you don't want to troll so so no trolling um and then and what is the wind sock where would somebody or no i'm calling it a wind sock but what's what's the name of it uh drift sock yeah drift sock where, where, where would somebody get one of those uh cabela's has uh, uh has them i think Devin has i think he used to carry them on tactical fly fisher uh you can find them a variety of like marina type uh websites um and and depending on the size of your boat you know people try to they have recommendations on sizes uh for a, a certain size boat i feel like a lot of those are undersized i would say for this application do get at least a size or two bigger um that way it'll really slow your boat down and and allow you to achieve that that speed that you want yeah you don't want your your boat you know, uh, accelerating any faster than you need to basically yep. it prevents you from struggling to keep contact with your flies as, as you're retrieving. So it, it'll help keep that, that speed you want. Keep it going. Yep. Is it okay to use that with like any boat? I think, you know, a drift boat is, is that okay to use or oh, yeah. is it, yeah. it, it, it can be a challenge to find that sweet spot for the, the, or the drogue is what they call it. Uh, drift. Yeah, drogue. Drogue. yeah. Yeah, that's the other term. So positioning your drogue on the boat, especially if you have like a classic high side or anything like that, where you have the bow uh, pointing up higher than the stern, um, positioning the drift sock to where, because what your boat will end up doing is it'll camber uh, depending on, you know, the speed of wind. So it may cock to one side and just start drifting that direction rather than going straight down 90 degrees. So, you know, spend the time to just kind of either pull the drogue towards the bow or towards the stern and that'll, that'll straighten out the, the boat for you. So you just got to get, uh, accustomed to doing that, uh, you know, yeah. boat to boat, basically you get a skiff or something that's a lot more level. You don't necessarily need to do that all the time. Weight, uh, uh distribution in the boat can, uh, factor in as well. So you got a big guy on the bow or a big guy on the stern you know, that'll change your drift, uh, as well. So that'll, that'll shift your position of the drogue, uh, yep. off the boat. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, what were you guys, what was the boat you guys were using out there when you're doing that or crane or what do you typically use for your, your lake boat? Crane Prairie had a Marina. And so they oh, had yeah. just some John boat style, which are perfect. They're, they're great hard hull, shorter boats. Um, a lot of times what we do is, is, uh, Oh shoot, I forget what they call them, but basically it's a it's a little bench board that you can put into the boat so it sits on the gunnels of the boat so you sit hmm. up higher. Again, oh, remember right. you're not allowed to stand, but you can prop yourself oh, wow. up. Yeah. Yeah, so uh <laughs> and if you have uh skiffs, uh you know, uh, drift boat skiffs, so they're a lot shallower um mm -hmm. design. Those are a lot nicer because you can keep your rod down closer to the water. Uh, for your retrieve so a lot of the high side boats and and that sort of thing are, are horrible because you have to reach over the top of the gunnel yeah. uh, in order to get your rod tip down and get your retrieve the way you want it uh, which can inhibit uh, a That's lot of right. your retrieve styles so all right uh, but yeah so uh yeah crane Perry had a marina that had a had a lot of uh, identical john boats so it helps when you're dealing in a competition trying to keep an evil even kill for all the competitors so boats is one thing too you get a lot of uh, regionals and, uh, I've hosted regionals here and, you know, you're just trying to pull as many volunteers and ha have as many of them bring whatever boat they got. And you got all these boat styles and 
you know, obviously if somebody's not winning, they're going to blame something other yeah. than themselves. So the boat just. Yeah, it's always the boat. The boat. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That is a good uh, a good tip on the boats because I, I those uh, yeah the drift boats are high sided but those lower skiffs are really cool so that the skiff would yeah. be a good lake boat to use it would it would they are um, Pretty flat. you know so uh, very easy to fish out of uh, a lot of times too uh, find something that's clean meaning you know no very few snag points so rafts are horrible with casting platforms and that sort of thing. Cause they have all those little buckles and, you know, screw down points for the frames and all that. Just a lot of stuff for your line to get tangled around. Um, one tip for folks that are out, uh, in boats fishing these techniques is take a, a wet towel, a beach towel or something like that, and just get it damp and lay it down like a casting deck, casting mm-hmm. platform. So it gives you a clean surface to cast. Uh, and so when you strip in your line, it's not wrapping around all this other stuff. It's just laying down on that top. All right. Yeah. So there you go. That's another another good tip. Well, before we move off of the Stillwater stuff here, any other uh, tips you want to throw out? Maybe a couple more tips. You've given here quite a few good ones. If you're, let's say, take it back to Crane. You know, somebody's getting ready to fish Crane. Let's say they have a boat. They've got a, you know, a skiff or a John boat. They're heading out there. What else would you tell them to try to find some fish? Uh, one big tip is keep your head on a swivel. Obviously you're not, if you're pulling flies, you're not throwing dry flies, uh, most of the time. So if you're retrieving, you know, you're maintaining contact, keep your head on a swivel, always look around. Uh, you'll, you like a lot of other fish, you may see fish rising. And if the, the rise forms are congregated or a lot closer together, that may give you, an idea that there might be, you know, a pot of fish over there, uh, or what, again, you know, like saltwater stuff, nervous water can, can give away positions of fish. If they're sitting just under the surface feeding, you know, that could be a good number of fish sitting in there. Um, but one fish could give away several other fish, you know, so always keep your head on a swivel. I remember one time we were uh, competing, uh, on root eye reservoir and the lake was off color. It was that, you know, red color of the the clay and sand or dirt that soil that's oh, yeah. around there yeah and they had some heavy rains or it was just runoff time i think it was post runoff so runoff was coming down but the lake was still pretty off color so anyway we were trying to figure out where these fish were hanging out we we're working all the usual stuff the bank edges points and we were struggling you know and i was kind of uh, me and uh i think it was me and lance were in the boat together uh because you know we're we're fishing together trying to figure this lake out and i kept looking back behind me and i'd see these splashes every once in a while and i'm like like hey lance have you seen that back there like there's and it's out in the middle of the lake and we did we do have a depth finder finder that we carry with us you know a little portable one and uh it wasn't about 100 100 feet foot of water um you know we were trying to work the stuff that was about 10 to 10 or shallower, you know, thinking that light penetration would give us the advantage we're working along the edges. Uh, but no, these fish just wanted to be high up in the water column and out in the deep water. And, and that, you know, we looked back there and so like, well, let's go check it out. It's practice. We need to figure out, figure out where these fish are. So we motored out to the middle of the lake and sure enough, that's where those fish were. And so it had not been for us keeping, you know, heads on a swivel, looking around, um, always looking out for more fish. Uh, that was a benefit to us and, so, and worked well. And you got into them on like uh, on the surface, or how how'd you get into those? Yeah, no, they were they were subsurface, but you know within that uh, really two foot of water column just under the surface. Yeah, and uh, you know big bushy type flies uh, worked well. A lot of flash, uh, uh-huh. l- lighter in color, um, and a pretty pretty quick retrieve. They they wanted it fast, surprisingly, in that off color water. I was. I was kind of surprised at, at, at their behavior. So, and a quick retrieve, what a pretty quick retrieve would be, kind of like just strip, strip. Like, what would be a exactly? Quick... Maybe even slightly faster. So, like strip, 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 strip. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, they were hammering it. <laughs> there you go. And, and fishing the big stuff. Cool. What's yeah. what about time? Um, Greg had a question about this one. Uh, time, best time to fish the lake, kind of light temperature, that sort of stuff. What, what do you what do you think about? You know, you're coming to a new lake. Uh, you know, should you be getting out there at the crack of dawn, or what's that look like? Uh, well, it depends on time of year. Obviously, crack of dawn, winter time, probably not the best. Uh, crack of dawn in the summer, probably your best time uh, or evening. 
But as I tell everybody, uh, you know, rivers included, however, obviously their temperature can be a very different uh, thing. Uh, they got to feed constantly. Uh, one thing about lakes is they do have that. Uh, they can uh, move out of the warmer temperatures and drop down into into the cooler stuff. Um, so you get that thermal climb. Uh, so you can track them as they descend into the water column, you know, finding the more optimal temperature zone. So uh, that's that's one way you can do it. So you can fish for them all day long. Uh, however, you know, the temperature does affect vegetation growth. <laughs> so that may limit you um, as to what you can access into the lake. If it's warmer uh, and you got a lot of weeds, it's hard to pull a fly through the weeds. We haven't quite mastered that uh, ability to work flies and keep them completely weedless. Uh, yeah. So your mornings or evenings when the fish come back up as it cools down, you lose light uh, or uh, you get lower light conditions. Uh, those might be your more optimal uh, scenarios. But, um, uh, you know, you get your spring or fall time frames all day long. You know, you just got to find where they're moving to. Uh, they may move up and down a few feet. Just adjust again. That's where your sinking, different sinking lines come into play to keep you in the zone where the fish are. Once you find that zone, and once you find that zone, do you find that they're in it for a, a good part of the day? You know, say you find them, they're they're at eight feet down. They may be there anywhere between, you know, depending on what your temperature fluctuation is like, uh, anywhere between uh, 15, 20 minutes to, yeah, a couple hours, uh, you know, they'll hold in that zone. Or if a hatch starts coming off, uh, that can change as well. They may be down deeper, and then all of a sudden, you know, they're up in that that upper um, two, three feet of the water column. You know, so again, not just necessarily getting down deeper is always the case. Uh, having to come back up and switch into a lighter line um, may be the difference too. How deep? I mean, if you think how how deep have you caught fish? Like, can you go like way down in some of these deeper lakes? Uh, I've done. <laughs> this was weird in in. Um, where were we? Czech Republic, I think. I was fishing an intermediate uh, tip line, uh, the Rio one. I can again, I can never remember the name of these, uh, but it had the little uh, three foot uh, intermediate sink tip on it. And I was doing a thirty count with two uh, woolly bugger, humongous type flies. They were big. They were like a size eight with a four mil bead on both of them. So real heavy, heavy rig. So a thirty count. You know, I was probably down 35, 30, 30 feet max, you know, and it was a really slow retrieve to stay down. And that's where I was catching fish. I won that session um, by staying down really, really deep. Um, you know, so that that's been probably about the deepest I've had to go. Uh, maybe our regional in Idaho, Utah, Idaho, that was uh, Daniel's Reservoir. I know we were having to to go pretty deep when we were fishing the dam side of the lake. <clears throat> the inlet side, we were staying in that first three feet majority of the day. Um, you know, really stripping a lot of the like uh, blank savers and that sort of thing through. Uh, that was doing pretty good for us. But yeah, once we got to towards the dam side, it was uh, we were a lot of us were finding fish deeper, uh, full sink, type six, type six. We we're dealing with heavy winds too. Yeah, we we're dealing with heavy winds. Uh, uh, that was an interesting um, venue and, and conditions yeah. we were dealing with. We were dealing with white caps. Wow. Uh, like 30, 40 mile an hour gusts. It was fun. Holy cow. But, uh, <laughs> that's it. Where, where would you say if somebody wanted to dig further into still waters, where's a good place people can go get some resources? Where where would you send them? Um, anything else, books or anything that you recommend? Um, Nobody really has a book. Uh, I was going to say from you, it's interesting because you guys are kind of creating some of this stuff, right? I mean, you're. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, you know, but I would, I would, you know, uh, anything that Phil Rowley. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, shoot. What's his name? Yeah. Up yeah. In Canada, yeah the... Phil, Phil and Brian Chan. Yeah, exactly. Great guys. Great. Uh, yeah. they, they do dial in a lot of that. Uh, basically the ecology and the behaviors of, of trout in lakes, which is, you know, going to be very key in you locating them. If you know the behavior, you'll be able to dial it in a lot yeah. better. But, you know, That's they it. do spend a lot of time in the coronamid realm. That's kind of, yep. you know, they developed uh, in the BC area uh, with suspension rigs. But they have started, and I've noticed a lot of uh, 
of what they've been doing has been related to a lot of the UK techniques or what we've been doing in competition. So uh, they're factoring a lot of the, the tractor type patterns, your humongous, your your blobs and all that stuff. So uh, very, very good sources. Um, I think Fly Fish Food obviously with Lance yeah. there, uh, they've targeted and, and uh, started to work a lot more on still water stuff. Um, so their videos are another good uh, source. And, you know, I've, I've got a few videos on, on my YouTube channel that you can check out. Oh, nice. Uh, but I need to dial it in and, and be a lot more comprehensive on, on what I'm doing on the still water. Uh, so I don't get a ton of time on the still water myself personally uh, these days. But uh, it's fun. I, I do love still water. That I need to, I need to get more time on the lake. Today's episode is sponsored by Fairflies, founded with the idea of finding ethical solutions to fly time materials and products. They've done just that by creating jobs for marginalized groups, both in the U.S. and abroad. They are experts, innovators, and artisans of exceptional fishing products. I've noted that I've connected with Jeff uh, a number of times a while back, and we, we had a connection right at the front, and it's been a good time now finally putting this together and hearing the story. We had Jeff on a podcast, and we heard about their 5D brushes and what it's all about, why brushes are a game changer in the fly tying space, making things faster, easier, more consistent, and uh, and they got it going. So the nice thing about what Fairfly is go- has going is they've got not only the materials, but they got tools going now. Now they own Wasatch Custom Angling Tools and are carrying on the tradition of hand-making heirloom quality fly tying tools. With over 50 tools, this is truly the do-it-yourself company. You can get all your tools and fly tie-in materials right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash fairflies, F-A-I-R-F-L-I-E-S. Check them out right now. You support this podcast by checking out that link to Fairflies. Okay, back to the show. This has been a good little episode. And we had, we've had... Phil and Brian and, and some the fly fish food guys on. So I'll put some links to the, the and yeah, actually yeah. Phil's done some good stuff on still our, that's who I was up there in BC with. And we did okay, the, yeah. the indicator thing, which was pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, doing yeah. The slip. Yep. <laughs> slip. The slip knot. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The slip bobber or whatever. Right. Um, <laughs> cool. Well, I wanted to uh, just, you were going to get out here in a little bit, but I wanted to, you know, for the Euro nymphing stuff, um, I want to dig into that here in a second, but um before we get there, I'm just, I just had one. We're doing a little segment. We're giving away some uh, free flies to a few winners. We're doing this top fly challenge. I just want to nice. give a shout out to that at uh, wetflyswing.com slash top fly. And it's kind of deal, real simple. Just kind of choose your, your favorite pattern. And then uh, and then we got some boxes to give out. But what's your, if you talk about your top fly, we're talking steel waters. You mentioned a bunch. Of, if you if you had to pick one, what, what would it be? Uh, my favorite pattern would be a humongous. I'd say that uh, the kind of the classic silver and black. Uh, it's another. It's a, I fish that fly a lot. <laughs> yeah, humongous. And what size typically? If we love a size it. ten is a yeah. good size ten hook. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, hook, hook. I'm just, and that's one I hadn't, hadn't. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, that's a. Oh right, with a huge tail. Yeah, I see it. Yeah. You see it? <laughs> nice. Yeah, giant. I mean, that tail for sure is three. I'm looking at the fly fish food. They've got one on the on their yeah. site. This one's this one's got kind of a green, um, kind of a black tail. Lots of flash, looks like, uh, and then a, kind of a greenish body. Yeah. So the flashaboo on it is is pretty heavy uh, on the underneath, and yeah, it's got that uh, silver um, tinsel chenille or crystal yeah. Chenille, or yeah, like that. Tinsel. And exactly. um, <clears throat> yeah, so it's a very very bright or can be bright that's it but so do you have a any uh, like a top fly a story that goes along with that fly do you have any memories of one that uh you know what i mean you probably caught a few fish on that thing uh yeah man caught a lot of fish and i think the initial when i just first saw it you know it just looks very unproportioned yeah it does it It looks very poorly proportioned you know but you look at this fly in the water and it just it just swims pulses you know dives up and down and just has a lot of life to it so um yeah when we first started fishing it um man it was just kind of a a very very productive start to utilizing the fly you know we were just blown away by it so does it have bee chain eyes on it uh they do time with bee chain um most of the time so bee chain or dumbbell eyes aren't allowed in competition we're only allowed uh you know just round beads or slotted beads uh, so I tie most of mine just with regular beads on them, tungsten beads, yeah, uh, tungsten. tungsten, 
you can tie them in brass or even plastic. So just depending on what type of sink rate or movement you want on that fly. The lighter the bead, obviously, it, it'll um, pull or move through the water a little more flat. So yeah. the tail being that long, it still has a lot of movement, a lot of wiggle in it. But uh, you throw a tungsten bead on it, then it has more of that dive, that up and down uh, motion. Uh, so take that into account when your time flies for still water. This is great. So your fly box, if you open up your box with, I mean, what does it look like? Do you have like a bunch of different sizes and weights of this one fly in all your flies? or how You must have like a bazillion uh, boxes. Yeah. So our leg boxes are, you know, I'm... I found these cool uh, pencil boxes at a craft store. And uh, so I made them myself. They're about the size of, I think they're like seven by nine or something like that, uh, six by nine, and filled them with foam. So, anyway, I had about, I have three of those. I can't find those boxes anymore. Uh, and then I have several other bigger, um, you know, sl- slotted foam style boxes, uh, basically. 8 by 11s I think. Uh, I have that with coronamids. Um, then I have another box that has like my uh, dabblers and and kind of like what you would imagine kind of classic uh, lake style flies would be, which actually do work well. So the old school flies like Invictas, Bloody Butchers, uh, you know, all those types of patterns. Um, and then I have the lure box, which has, uh, again, all the woolly bugger type patterns in there, which also span into like your mohair leeches, uh, damselfly patterns, uh, you know, and that's just, yeah, there's a lot of flies that uh, you carry around for a lake session. And then you have your other box with the boobies and the blobs and the fabs and you right. know, all that stuff in there, uh, worms even. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> I know the boxes are great. When we were up there with Phil and and Greg, I mean, yeah, they had a boxes just like their Coronamid boxes. And they were just loaded with all, you know colors, sizes, weights. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's kind of daunting, but we'll we'll keep the humongous. That's perfect. So that's one I don't have in my box. I'll definitely get that in, and looks that's probably a good one. The kids can we can throw out there and have them troll that there or not, not troll, but ha- we'll, we'll have them. Strip it works well. I mean, it's funny because I was just, you know, of course talking smack about trolling, but we, that's what we do when we locate, you know, if we have a boat we're all right, well, let's go check out this other point. Shoot. We'll just throw out a bunch of yeah, line, you know, strip exactly. out like all, all the way to our backing and just, yeah, you know, keep the flies in the water. <laughs> totally. That is a pretty good feel. I do like that thing when you're doing it you got a bunch of line out and all of a sudden the fish is on stripping off line. Exactly. And one thing too, I mean, you know, you catch fish, you're like, hmm, I should remember that spot next time. You know, yeah. there might be something there, either a high point underwater that you can't see. Maybe there's a spring or something. So, you know, it's keep your flies in the water. It helps you dial it in a little bit. Definitely. Definitely. Nice. Well, before we get out, I mentioned that on the Euro, I also want to check on one thing and I might be off, but you, I think I saw something there. You have some like uh, kind of uh, Native American or indigenous. Is that some of the background you have there? Yeah, so I am uh, of Pueblo descent, which are the the that's the indigenous people here in the Southwest, uh, or one of the indigenous people in the Southwest. So our our culture, the Pueblo culture, um, you know. So I'm from San Felipe Pueblo, uh, Laguna, and Hopi. So my mom, oh, okay. she's from San Felipe Pueblo, and in our culture, it's matrilineal. So we take our mom's side of, of pretty oh, much wow. everything. So uh, I'm affiliated with. San Felipe side, as well as her clans. Uh, my dad being Laguna uh, and half Hopi, I do uh, acknowledge those when, you know, we're talking to family or whatnot. So so that, just as, as an example, my mom, she's uh, Eagle Clan and my dad is Parrot Clan. So how I would reference who my parents are is I'm Big Eagle, Little Parrot. Hmm. So my that they know that your mom is Eagle Clan and your dad is Parrot. So that's how you reference oh, your, wow. your lineage. Uh, as well, you know, you don't intermix with those other clans. So right. it keeps, you know, keeps the bloodline <laughs> yep. uh, healthy. So uh, and you know, as a as another side note, my fiance she's from Okeawinge, which is uh, the northern part of uh, north of Santa Fe, and she's um, so. It can get very complicated very yeah. quick, but uh, so that's northern. That's Tewa. Uh, my mom or San Felipe and Laguna were Keras speaking uh, Pueblo people, 
she's from a, a pueblo that speaks Tewa, which are two different, completely different languages. And they don't have the clan system there. So, and they're patrilineal, so they take the dad side, huh. uh, but they don't have the same clan system oh, wow. as I do. So it can get very, very crazy and very complicated. But And that's in the same, and that's two groups in the same area. Within an hour away from each other, exactly. Wow. So wow. the culture is the different. same, the ideologies, uh, you know, how we reference a lot of our, our cultural um, uh, components are pretty much the same the language is different but then you have these different um uh these subtle differences in how we uh, either um, acknowledge our lineages or you know how just different spins and twists on things yeah. and that goes way back to you know when we're all pretty much one people and diverging and trying to find our way in the world of you know, through ecological situations, climate changes and all that stuff, you know, so there's a lot wow. of influence on our culture, on our evolution as people in this area by our environment, you know, so we're definitely keyed yep. and, and tied tight to uh, our, our world. <laughs> yeah, your area, probably a pretty close-knit area down there in that in that part of the, the world, right? New yeah. Mexico. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That, we had a recent episode, I'm always interested because... Um, you know that we had Indy fly on, and there, yeah, 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 the, yeah, the Wind River. You you know about that stuff going on? Yeah, so I know Darren very well. Uh, I know uh, uh, I think it was Matt uh, mentioned Darren working with Darren a little bit on the Wind River. He owns the Whitewater Rafting and Guiding Service. Oh yeah, 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 totally. Uh, yep. In the canyon there below uh, Boysen Reservoir. Um, yeah, he's a good buddy of mine, and I saw uh, if if you all want to learn a little bit more about that area, check out Tribal Waters video. Oh, cool. Uh, Patagonia, very good video. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah, it's an awesome, awesome video. So it definitely touches on the cultural and uh, indigenous stewardship aspect, uh, you know, in in fisheries as well as just kind of water conservation. So right, right. That's a huge. Yeah, I'll, I'm, I love that you brought the tribal waters. I'll put a link to that one for sure yeah. to watch that. That's uh, yeah, and that's a cool thing, you know. And I think that's a struggle is that. Uh, I think that might have been a question I asked, you know, as you dig into it, it's, it's interesting because you, you do have challenges, right. With some, on some of these reservations and stuff with kids, but getting them able yep. to become guides, right. I mean, you've been, you're a guide. I mean, what would you, when you look at that, do you see that as, as a pretty amazing opportunity to give some of these kids? I'm not even sure. It sounds like you, maybe you're not on the reservation, but are there reservations and things like that nearby your, your area? There is. I mean, uh, I didn't grow up on the reservation, so, you know, I was definitely given a lot of different uh, opportunities there. But even still, from tribe to tribe or indigenous people to, to indigenous people, um, it's not all the same because the cultures are different themselves, right. you know. So it, it can be a little tough to to get out of this pan-Indian type uh, yeah. uh uh, aspect of you know we're we're all the same or right. we all live in the same kind of uh, um, situation. Um, Pueblo people, one great thing for us, uh, as opposed to like Shoshone Arapaho or your or your more nomadic tribes, is we were sedentary, and so you know when we had to come under the Spanish rule, uh, ultimately into the U.S. government uh, and all that, um, you know we were. We had already been established in this area uh, for a long time before then, so we weren't getting moved uh, out of our food sources or out of our, our traditional lands. Uh, we just had to stay. We might have been relocated slightly in a different area. That was a little bit easier for the Spanish to keep an eye on us, but uh, you know, farming, um, agriculture was our subsistence way of life. So, um, So we were able to cope with it a little gotcha. bit better as well as to hold on to our culture a little bit better. Um, so, you know, that has a lot to do with, with the health and, and, um, kind of the, the, the integrity of our people. It's not to say we don't suffer from the same yeah. issues, you know, uh, poor health, diabetes, alcoholism, you know, um, suicide rates, all that stuff, you know, it, yeah. it, it does affect us quite a bit still. Uh, however, you know, because going from a traditional way of life uh, or growing up that way and, and trying to make it into a Western culture, Western society, yeah, it's a struggle, you know, that can be tough. But uh, one great thing about indigenous cultures is normally there's uh, it's a family based um, culture, you know, so you have a lot of support from your family. Which can be good and bad sometimes, you know, if you're trying to make your way outside of that, uh, you know, they're wondering why you're leaving home. Right. <laughs> Yeah, uh, 
but you know or you have the other where they want you to go out and and um you know find your way in this world so uh luckily i had the support of of my parents that were like them you know they moved off the reservation to to find uh, how to live in this world and um they did the same thing for me as far as giving me those opportunities and supporting those opportunities for me to travel and experience the world which you know in truth a lot of our culture is based on that you know our what we call our migration stories and that sort of thing it's because people left to go find something different or or better or you know to travel the world or this world that they knew um and uh so that that got us to where we are now so i don't know a lot of a lot yeah, of things going on this that i could touch base on based on our culture you know <laughs> i know I, it is good i'm always interested in it because it is a a crazy cool you know amazing history of of this you know this country and lots of places around the world you know and, and it's, right, right we i always love to give a shout out people probably gonna get tired but uh superman if you haven't heard of him, oh yeah, it, yeah 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 no i i I don't know him personally, but I yeah I, I know his work and yeah. Uh, but tons of new artists coming out and oh uh, yeah, are there? But there's a lot of good stuff coming out. Yeah, yeah. That's so great. if you haven't noticed or uh, listened, but uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Snotty Resnose Kids and uh, okay. Travis Thompson are my daughters. She's a big Travis Thompson fan. <laughs> okay, nice. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so yeah. But anyway, yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's great i'll put I, I love to get that's one of those things occasionally if i get some music out of out of the guests it's awesome because i'll right, get, a, right, yeah, get yeah. a video to then we can expand our uh our listening so we'll get some travis johnson in there somewhere yeah <laughs> um, thompson, thompson travis thompson yeah thompson he's in your area actually he's in uh you're oh, in seattle right, right? uh yeah, actually yeah. i'm down in, in oregon but yeah pretty close oh yeah oregon so yeah he's up in the northwest i, I think he's out of seattle he yeah yeah, perfect. Yeah, that's that's good. Well, I'll we'll do that. And well, I think uh, I'm feeling pretty good about this. What do you think about doing just a quick little rapid fire uh, Euro nymphing tips? Uh, we've yeah, had a ton sure. of Euro nymphing. You know, like I said, we talked about a lot of the people that have been on here, but um, it's always good to do a refresher if if you know the Definitely. quick Euro nymph. So Euro nymphing 101. What are some tips you tell somebody? They're, they got all their gear. They're heading out. They're they're a little bit scary because they're not sure about casting the the line, the leader. Right, what, what do right. you tell them? So, uh, you know, start out with your casting. Uh, you do want to accentuate and uh, exaggerate that oval. So as you start to lift or, or initiate your casting, keep it a little bit more off to your side. And as you come back behind you, come over the top, over the head. So you're creating right. that oval shape, uh, keeping that those flies from tangling. So if you do your traditional uh back cast where you come straight up and then come mm. straight forward again you know the whole thing about back casting is you want to stay in as true of a plane as possible mm -hmm. it's not going to happen as efficiently with the euro setup typically because you have to have a softer rod but more or less your leader it typically doesn't have the same taper as you would with a standard tapered leader uh, it's very thin in diameter has a little bit harder time transferring energy from the rod down the line to your flies to turn over so you get a lot of hinging in some in uh, portions of the cast so starting uh, off your side and then coming over the top on your forward stroke okay um, helps keep those from tangling as much um, and then you know as you start your drift keeping contact with your flies as soon as your flies touch the water is key uh, so you know, not bringing and letting your line settle totally, settle totally on the water, but stopping just slightly above the water with your rod tip or a little bit higher uh, helps keep that contact with your line or keep your line straight. But also, you're you're able to see your sighter much quicker and determine your height uh, of the rod mean, to maintain contact as you go through the drift. Uh, so as soon as your flies hit the water, be ready. There's no setup time uh, with Euro nymphing. Uh, that's the whole intention of urine nymphing is when your flies in the water, you're fishing. So as soon as they hit the water, be ready. I, you don't know how many times I've had fish eat as soon as that fly hits the water, or as soon as your flies leave the water, you do that little hook set at the end of your, uh, of your drift to initiate the cast one, but also to check because as your flies start to pivot and swing under the cider downstream, there's a little bit of slack there that makes it difficult to read off the cider or even fill. Uh, and that brings me to my next point, uh, with your nymphing, don't rely on filling the strike. Filling the strike is, uh, a point that's always, uh, stressed in a lot of videos that I see nowadays. 
you're still missing probably about 60% of the strikes, if not higher, uh, if you're trying to wait and fill. Because like an indicator, by the time that fish pulls the indicator down without you're seeing visually, um, because it, you know, if you're doing an inline rig, it takes your fly, it has to transfer, the, the potential has to transfer through the weight up to your indicator. You're delayed, uh, and by the time you see that indicator go down, uh, most of the time, I, I 100% feel it's the fish trying to get the fly out of his mouth. <laughs> yeah. So when you set, you're already way behind. So same thing with filling the strike when you're urine and finger tight lining. Uh, by the time you fill it, you know that's the moment that your line has gotten tight and transferred down the rod to your hand uh, or down the line to your hand. Uh, you're behind the hook set. Watch that cider straighten out, tension up, dip a little bit read the cider more, pay more attention to that than trying to f- wait and feel for the strike. Uh, you'll increase your hookup ratio. I've worked with a lot of guys who compete and, uh, you know, got them tuned in to seeing what's happening to the cider. And it's helped them increase their, their uh, catch rate. So, And as well as their, you know, hookup to landing ratio. That's huge, you know, especially in a competition. You need to land your fish. Yeah. So if you're that much more in tune to setting the hook when you need to, you get a lot better hook set rather than, you know, again, if they're trying to get that fly to the mouth, you're just on the very edge or fringe yeah. edge of the, of the whip. So, um, let's see what else. Uh, yeah, you need to order some, uh, HDA Fay variants, uh, from Umco Feather Merchants. That's a fly pattern that I've designed for them. Oh, okay. Well, what, what's um, it called? So it's like, uh, HDA Fay variant. Okay. Yeah, so I am the uh, fly designer for uh, Umco Feather Merchants. So I have the HDA Fay Perdu Chingon, uh, which is a Perdigon pattern. And uh, the Chingon is kind of for Hispanic people or people in the Southwest. Uh, uh-huh. It means like it's, it's you know, that flies the shit. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. So it's a play on the Perdigon. Perdu Chingon. Chingon, right, right, right. <laughs> Chingon. I've heard that before. People, yeah. They, yeah, a little, they wonder how to pronounce it, but yeah, Perdu Chingon. So that's another uh, urinip pattern that I have out. And ICU midge, um, low water betas is the one dry fly that I have uh, in that mix too. Oh, yeah. So it's intended for kind of that flatter, more picky uh, fish situation. So yeah, let's see what else as far. Yeah, there's so many. I mean, I'm thinking if we get say we got our little four or five euro tips to take us out of that. We got I think we got like I guess uh, one other one uh, yeah. as far as your depth, like you know between your cider and your flies. Um, one that I stress is I always keep the distance between my flies. I, I normally just run two flies. So between my dropper and my point flies, I was going to be about 20, 24 inches. Okay. Uh, I want enough distance. So if I hook a fish on the dropper and I drop it, I'm not foul hooking it with a point fly. Right. It does happen on occasion, but that reduces the amount of foul hooking you may have. If they're yep. closer together, it happens a lot more often. Uh, so the distance or the variable that is that you can change is going to be from the bottom of your cider. Most people have tippet rings down there at the bottom of the cider. Uh, to your dropper, that can be the the distance that you want to adjust and and change depth with. So you know when you get to the river, or if you get to an unknown river, I always hold off in setting up my my uh, my rig, uh, so I can look at the depth or or gain an idea of what the average depth could be. Most of the time, I start two feet, and that can cover most rivers in the southwest or most fishing situations truthfully uh because you know certain depth of water um produces a lot that i find anywhere that i fish you know it could be uh just from a few inches deep enough to cover the fish's back down to about two feet you know that's going to be a zone or three feet of a zone that i feel really really confident comfortable fishing in that i know fish will be holding in most situations uh <clears throat> unless you're dealing with cold water or big rivers you know uh, then you may need to go deeper. So two feet is a good start for me. But again, a lot of times if it's new territory or a new river, uh, I hold off on setting up until I look at the water. Uh, so let's say uh, if I went to the San Juan, there's a lot of deeper sections in there. I would go uh, from my cider to my point, my dropper fly, sorry. Yep. Uh, cider to my dropper, uh, I might lengthen that out to three feet. Okay. Uh, because you don't necessarily want your cider in the water all the time. Um, because it's typically a, a slightly thicker or a thicker diameter oh, tippet yeah. thing or what you're running to your flies. It creates a little bit more drag when it's in the water. You can drop it in to kind of just fill out what's going on down there. 
uh, under the water, if you need to go down, you know, a, a foot or even less than that, six inches, eight inches, depending on, you know, how you have your cider set up to let you know how, what your depth is you're achieving by lowering the rod and dropping the cider into the water. Uh, then you can kind of get an idea, drop it in a little bit more, boom, you get a hit. You may need to go a little longer between your tippet ring and your dropper uh, just to stay in that zone better. Again, it's all about staying in the in the face of the fish. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. So that's basically yeah, below your your cider, your tippet ring. You got you know twenty four inches, thirty six inches. Then below that, your dropper. You got your lead fly another so twenty four inches. So you have like four foot leaders essentially. Exactly. That's a good base to start with, and that keeps you in the zone in a lot of again in that shallower water. Um, you know, that helps to keep both flies in the water itself. Um, you know, um, again, a couple tips here. If you're in shallow water, keep your rod angle lower, but lead more, uh, keeping the tension on the flies. If you go more vertical and typically a lot of times that, that water type is a little bit faster moving anyway, again, transitions from a shelf or a shallow riffle, uh, you know, dropping into a pool, that sort of thing. So you can pull your flies just slightly or, or accelerate your rod speed a little bit more through the drift. Uh, if it's a little bit deeper, a little slower, then your rod is going to go more vertical, but you don't have to worry about pulling your dropper out of the water when you go more vertical to keep your tension, keep your, your connection to your flies because it's deeper, you know? Yeah. So in the shallower yeah. water. You don't want to go too vertical or to bring your dropper out of the water unless you want to keep that dropper right in the surface film, which I've done a lot because, you know, you have oh, yeah. an emergency sort of thing. So right, right. That's uh, cool. you're yeah. nymphing. Yeah, your flies aren't necessarily intended to stay on the bottom. Your point fly is uh, that'll stay close to the bottom. Uh, you can use the dropper and I set up with my heavier fly or. You know, my point fly will be the heaviest if it is, uh, but I intend to move my dropper up and down the water column, you know, to find where the fish are feeding. So right. uh, that in mind. So I know Lance, uh, a couple other guys on the team, they, they do rig differently. They may have their dropper as the heavier fly and their point fly is lighter, you know. Um, gotcha. But it, it just depends on, on your yeah. preferred method. Right. So on this one, your heavier fly is your dropper or your point fly? My point fly. Yeah, your point if, fly. Yeah. If it is heavier. And that being said, your point fly doesn't always necessarily to be a super heavy type mm -hmm. fly. I run a lot of rigs where both flies are the same size, same size bead, same weight, basically. Yeah. Um, and, you know, trust that your flies are getting down. A lot of folks, they're because they don't either they don't feel the bottom or they're not sure or they don't have confidence that they're on the bottom. Uh, tend to go too heavy on their on their point fly, and because they don't feel it necessarily, they start lowering the rod, trying to add more tippet down under underneath. Do the reverse: lift your rod higher, get tighter to your flies, and you'll register those strikes a lot better too. So, tons of tips. I mean, yeah, you know. those are great. Okay, we'll we'll, we'll <laughs> add them up and uh, we'll put a little list uh, in the right, show yeah, notes. Just like boom, 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 boom. Yeah, yeah boom. we got yeah, we got at least I think we get we're getting close to ten, so we're right. <laughs> we're, we're good there. This has been awesome. Um, Nice. Well, I think we'll let you get out of here. Um, where should we send people if they have questions for you? Uh, look for me on uh, social media, Instagram, Facebook, uh, YouTube. I'm there as well. Uh, you can send comments on all of those or, or direct message. Uh, Nmak Tima Fly Fishing. Yep. So N-M-A-K-T-I-M-A -A -A, Fly Fishing, all spelled out. There you go. Perfect. Well, we'll cover all this. Uh, like we said in the show notes, I'll have links out to your Instagram and, and your YouTube channel and and yeah, I think this is, we covered, I feel good about the still water. I love that we, we touched on, you know, talked about woolly buggers, you know, and, and that's really, that's a really cool, uh, you know, it's old school for me. So that's great. Yeah, um, exactly. But, you know, like I said, you know, like a lot of flies that evolve and have, you know, they all start families of themselves, like chubby, like Chernobyl's, Chernobyl yeah. ants, you know, you get all these different, uh, evolutions right. of your pattern. So these are. These are uh, varying styles of a woolly bugger, but yeah, it's a woolly bugger. <laughs> it's a woolly bugger. No, I love it. Well, it is the greatest fly of all time, right? That's pretty much yeah. the, the case. Oh, so. yeah. Nice, Norbert. Well, thanks again for the time and definitely uh, appreciate you you know, shedding some light on the still water and the Euro uh, tips. So uh, we'll, we'll keep in touch with you and uh, hope to talk to you soon. Yeah, definitely, man. Enjoyed it. And uh, thanks for having me on. So there you go. If you want to find the show notes, all links, and everything else we talked about today, you can head over to wetflyswing.com slash 348. 348 will get you some of those links. I know we talked about a number of uh, 
of good ones today. Uh, there's going to be at least a video or two you can check out. Plus, we'll have some links to our old podcast uh, episodes we've referenced today. Norm mentioned his top fly. We dug into that a little bit, and uh, that was part of this top fly challenge. Just want to remind you, you can go to wetflyswing.com slash top fly, and you can enter to win a box of flies right now. That's the way to do it. Check it out right now. Jackson's giving out uh, fly boxes this month and next month, so it's a good chance to uh, get a shot. And uh, and if you want, the bonus, the bonus here is that I'm giving out a free a free big shout out on the podcast. If you want to tell me your top fly story, send me an email or DM quickly. I'd love to hear from you and, or just say, Hey, we'd love to hear, even if you don't do anything on that, just say, Hey, that would be amazing. Okay. I'm on the way out of here. It is a hot one. It's a hot one this week. So uh, I'm going to try to stay cool, uh, get in that cold plunge and uh, try to rejuvenate uh, the body. Um, I actually haven't done the cold plunge, uh, but I've heard a lot about it. So if you've done a cold plunge, give me a shout out. I would love to hear if, uh, what it's all about. Uh, if it's, uh, if it's good, if it helps your fishing, helps your fly tying, um, let's hear about it. Okay. I'm going to let you get out of here and we are going to move on to that next episode. Hope you are having a good morning. I hope you're having a good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Looking forward to catching you online or hopefully on the water. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.